I thought I was, but let me try to. Better? Better, yeah. yes, thank you very much. Uh, yeah, it's recording. Okay, so welcome everyone. Today we have uh, three speakers presenting in our webinar, and now I proceed to introduce each of them. So we have Michael Jordan, uh, he's the uh, P. Hong Cheng Distinguished Professor in the Department of Electrical Engineering and Computer Science and the Department of Statistics at the University of California, Berkeley. Professor Jordan is a member of the National Academy of Sciences, a member of the National Academy of Engineering, and a member of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. He is also a fellow of multiple uh, academic uh, associations. Professor Jordan has a long record of high impact publications, uh, received numerous awards, and advised many students. His research interests are at the intersection of the computational, statistical, cognitive, and biological sciences. We also have with us Ryan Giordano, who is currently a statistics postdoc in Tamara Broderick's group in MIT. In 2019, Ryan obtained his PhD in statistics at UC Berkeley, and his current research interests include variational methods, Bayesian robustness, sensitivity analysis, and open software. Finally, I also have the great pleasure of introducing uh, Brian Liu, uh, who is currently a fifth year PhD student in the UC Berkeley Statistics Department. His research focuses on approximate Bayesian inference with primary application domain line in variational inference for large, large scale astronomy data sets. The title of, this, of their talk today is Assessing Sensitivity to the Steel Breaking Prior in Bayesian Nonparametrics. So recall that you can ask clarification questions during the presentation. However, we ask you to hold all non-clarification questions until the end of the presentation. So without further ado, please join me in welcoming uh, our speakers today. All right, thanks kindly for that great introduction. Um, I really love this format. Thanks everyone for joining us. Um, I'm gonna be giving the first third of the talk and then my colleagues will give the second two thirds of the talk. So you'll have a chance to, to get to know all three of us. Um, let me also acknowledge a fourth collaborator, which is Tamara, uh, her picture's down there in the lower right. Um, the four of us have been working on this project for now a couple of years um, and work with Ryan and, and Tamara goes back several years uh, in bringing variational methods kind of to a fuller flowering uh, in terms of its infer inferential goals and inferential capabilities. And so we're going to talk, it's going to be a somewhat applied talk. We're going to actually talk about some real data analysis and some real inferential issues. Um, many of you have worked on uh, sensitivity issues, sensitivity to priors and all, and I'm very eager to hear some of your feedback about this particular approach to it. Um, the overall message is going to be that variational methods, which is this somehow mysterious technology uh, that's sort of slowly making its way into the statistical world. Um, it's been very slow, but steady. Um, it's really set up beautifully to make inferences about uh, sensitivities and to, to, um, to do sensitivity analysis, and that's what I mainly want us to try to, I think we'll try to convey today. Um, so let me start with a motivating example. Um, it's a clustering problem. Um, this is one that comes from uh, genomic sequences where you're looking at haplotype structure. Um, and so in particular, this is uh, microsatellite uh, uh, data from a particular species of bird. And um, you see these at seven loci um, and these are microsatellites. So differences in links of the satellites. And if you just kind of plot them in this way and uh, do kind of an eyeball clustering, you can see that there are several clusters. Um, there are probably are many more out there. These are ones that appeared in the particular data set. Um, and, um, you know, you, you can uh, try to make inferences about how many clusters there are and uh, where they are and which individuals belong to what clusters and so on and so forth. Um, so um, there appear to be three primary populations here, as you can see, but there's many, many rare and small populations. Um, so, you know, based on parametrics feels like an appropriate tool for this kind of data, and people have worked with it uh, in the um, population genetics world. In fact, structure is, is, is a very natural Bayesian approach to these kinds of problems. Um, and the inferential problems are ones that you all know about, you know, how many distinct populations there are um, in the data set, but also then in the population itself. How many of them have more than n loci? Um, and if you were to get more data, how many more clusters would you start to see? Okay. Um, we also want to know uh, which cluster, individual cluster together. You're going to start to want to be able to understand uh, 
migratory patterns of these birds and uh, give evidence for that. And knowing who goes with what um, allows you to sort of start to make those inferences in a, in a fairly sort of uh, natural and, and cheap way. Okay, and so in particular, if you just look at zoom in on this little section here of A and B, um, one of them is in the middle of this bigger cluster of Mbololo, and the other is inside of a bigger cluster of Ngaugao. And, um, but if you look at them, they look very similar. In fact, really almost at the micro level, there's a lot of similarity between the two of them. And so this might lead you to, to infer that there was actual migration between these locations where these birds are um, prominently um, dominant. Okay, so if you're gonna make those kind of inferences, you're gonna have to build a model and you're gonna have to choose a prior. And you'd like this kind of inference to uh, either not depend much on the prior or to be able to be clear on how it depends on the prior. So that's going to be the focus of, of, the, of the talk. And so we're going to be looking at basing on parametric models. We're going to have the basic core ingredient being stick proportions uh, that lead to all these other inferences. Um, and then we're going to consider perturbations around uh, stick proportion probabilities. Um, and so there's going to be a wide range of kinds of perturbations. Some of them will be parametric and some of them will be non-parametric. And we're going to investigate tools that allow us to say how much sensitivity we see in these different functional directions. Um, um, uh, you know, we, we can't co entirely cover the space, we can cover certain directions we might be interested in. Okay, so we want to do Bayesian inference in this setting. We're going to be doing variational Bayes, and let's just accept that in this talk that we're going to be doing that. We're going to try to expound some of the advantages that, that uh, it gives you in terms of calculating, manipulating, ex and uh, uh, visualizing sensitivities. Um, and so we want to understand this, this particular approach to, approach to posterior inference. Uh, it is itself, uh, of course, a Bayesian tool and it's sensitive to, um, uh, to the choices. And we want to know, can we reveal within the model itself how sensitive it is? And can we report that back to the, to the scientist? All right, now um, it, we could certainly rerun the model for multiple model choices. Um, but uh, the scale we're at, that's going to be a very expensive proposition. And so we'd like to somehow just run the model once and read out sensitivities from a single run of the procedure. Okay. And that's going to be possible just basically because this is a perturbation based technology. And you can calculate the perturbations within a single run using automatic differentiation kind of tools. So you can get a suite of perturbations within a single run and then start to investigate the perturbations. Okay. So that's going to be the goal here. Um, once you, by the way, identify some of the real sensitivities, you then would focus in on those and perhaps refit a model with a different prior and then start to investigate a different part of the space. Okay, so um, outline, um, I, I'm going to talk about just the first two bullets there um, somewhat briefly and turn it over to Ryan and Brian to talk about um, the, the, the latter three. Um, but as you can see, we're going to just sort of introduce our model. That's going to be very quick. Talk a little bit about the variational approximation for this model and then get into all the calculations of, of sensitivities, derivatives, influence functions, and all that, and then return to a, um, a real application on these, um, on these bird data. Okay, so for this audience, I don't have to review this. Let me just let it sit there for a minute. Um, we're gonna be uh, looking at these stick-breaking kinds of priors. So we're gonna start at least with, our, with a model based on beta one comma alpha. Um, and uh, we're going to ask, um, is that actually uh, a good choice of a prior? Is it, is it, are we robust to the choice of prior? How sensitive are we to the choice of alpha, but also how sensitive were we to the choice of beta itself? And should we even be in the beta family? Uh, can we reveal that from the run of a model that's based at the beta model? Okay, so let me spend a couple of moments on this slide. Um, variational inference is something I've been working on for a long, long time. Uh, it's come to mean different things for different people. Uh, for most people, it just means you sort of set up a kolbeck liebler divergence and you maximize it, and that spits out a bunch of numbers that approximate a posterior. And I, I want to kind of convey that's a very limited way to think about it. Um, it's really not the right way to think about it. Uh, you know, variational just refers to uh, a whole technology going back to calculus of variations that allows you to do perturbations around solutions to problems, often inverse problems, uh, sometimes algebraic problems, sometimes integrals. And, um, you know, physicists do this sort of thing all the time. They have variational expansions and, and they explore wave functions and other kind of objects uh, in, in this style. 
Um, and, and statistics is really not done very much of this. We write down integrals and we write down sampling mechanisms. We haven't kind of, a, you know, gone this kind of other route. Um, so let me just uh, very, very elementary, you know, think about it, uh, the definition of an eigenvalue, right? Algebraically, it's a value lambda such that ax is equal to lambda x for some x. Um, so that's an algebraic uh, definition, but you can also write down an optimization problem whose solution is the same uh, as the maximal eigenvalue. So there it is, it's a Rayleigh uh, co coefficient. But the key here is that uh, we got a quadratic form, we're dividing by a quadratic form, it's just some uh, rational function, but it's an optimization problem. We, we, we take a maximization. And um, you can now, in this case, do it in closed form, but if you do, can't do it in closed form, you could run numerical algorithms to do it. Moreover, you could perturb those numerical algorithms you can calculate um, x plus a delta x in various directions. You can learn a lot more about the structure of the problem having written it in this way. At least you can bring very different kinds of tools to it. And you know the, the, the terminology of test functions, many of you will be aware of. Uh, in probability, you often will multiply something by a test function and then integrate it and learn something about it. Here, we're gonna use test functions in a, in a related but different way. And we're gonna be exploring directions in the space using test functions. All right, so um, if we now go into probability and statistics, you know, we often work with likelihood-based objects and the optimization problems will often involve entropic kind of quantities like Hale divergence. And the test functions are often simplified versions of those um, likelihoods. Maybe they're um, you know, completely factored or maybe they're in the exponential family or, or maybe they have other structures. And that's kind of what classically is thought of as variational um, methods or mean field methods. But here in this talk, I hope you'll see that we can go much, much further. We can calculate all kinds of other derivatives that give us much more information um, about the model we're fitting. Okay, so just briefly now, returning to our stick breaking situation, um, here we are going to set up a Kolbeck Liebler divergence. Um, and this would be just kind of the classical ending point of a classical talk. Uh, this, you know, Dave Bly and I had a paper doing this uh, many years ago. Um, you know, so instead of having uh, what we have, in addition to all the stick breaking uh, probabilities, we're going to set up stick lengths uh, parameterized by eta that give us a, um, a distribution that we're going to try to, to make close to, uh, to P. Uh, we're going to measure closeness in the Kolbeck labor div uh, labor divergence. Um, and then we're going to turn this into an optimization problem, just like we talked about before. And it's going to be over these extra degrees of freedom, uh, eta, that allows us to uh, find necessary conditions for optimality and um, um, you know, get an algorithm that finds those. Okay, so that's a way of kind of solving a fitting problem. But we're gonna wanna go further. We're gonna want to explore more of the differential structure around this objective, okay? Um, so if you solve that problem, you find a parameter vector eta hat, which has these variational degrees of freedom that you use to get your necessary conditions. And from eta hat, you can then um, read off various expectations you might care about um, you can, um, you know, calculate various posterior quantities that you want uh, to calculate. Um, but now we're going to ask the further question about how do these posterior quantities depend on the choice of the prior? And I believe that I'm done at this point. I'm going to be handing it over to, to Ryan. So if that's true, Ryan, I'm going to make it easy for you by um, stopping my share and letting you share. Cool. Okay. Can everyone see this? And it should be full screen. Uh, can everyone see and hear me? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So I'm going to be talking a little bit about the um, theory that allows us to uh, uh, compute approximations to how this variational optimum depends on the prior, uh, both in a parametric and in a non-parametric way. And then I'm going to pass it over to Brian, who is going to apply some of these theoretical tools to analyze that uh, thrush data um, data set that we started the talk with. Right, so um, uh, all sensitivity comes down to parametric sensitivity. So we're going to step back and uh, make an abstraction that we're going to have some uh, hyperparameter t, which is real valued, uh, which parameterizes the stick breaking density somehow. Uh, uh, probably the most comfortable thing to think about is you could imagine just that t is alpha, t is the concentration parameter in the beta one alpha prior. Uh, but later on, I'm going to use t to parameterize functional shapes in order to explore non-parametric. Um, sensitivity. We'll start with t being a real valued hyperparameter. Now, the prior depends on t, and so the posterior in turn depends on t. You see this dependence here. So the KL divergence between our variational approximation and the posterior also depends on t, and so in turn its minimum 
uh, over the variational parameters depends on t. So we're going to write this like this. Our eta hat, our optimal variational parameters, now depends on uh, t. Now, having written it this way, actually, we haven't really added anything uh, because evaluating the dependence of eta hat on t requires solving a new optimization problem, minimizing a new KL divergence. Uh, however, writing it this form motivates uh, approximating eta hat's dependence on t with a first order Taylor series expansion. So suppose we've evaluated eta hat at some t equals zero without loss of generality, we'll call it t equals zero uh, by solving one optimization problem. And if we can compute this derivative, then approximating the variational distribution at different values of t just requires doing this vector scalar multiplication. So instead of solving a new optimization problem, we can do a very fast um, multiplication to get this approximate dependence on t. Um, now, I want to call uh, uh, to attention the fact that the only expensive part of this problem is the mapping from the prior to the variational distribution. And we can retain nonlinearities in the map from the variational parameters to quantities of interest like the expected number of clusters and so on. Now, this work uh, that, we're, that we're doing is uh, really indebted to a line of work uh, by Paul Gustafson in the mid-90s. Uh, basically, what we're doing, if you're familiar with this, is Bayesian local robustness, but we're doing it for variational Bayes. Uh, now, of course, this is only useful if we can evaluate this derivative. Um, now, eta hat depends on t implicitly through the solution to this optimization problem. So you might be wondering, how can we evaluate it? I'm going to talk about that on the next slide. Uh, but the key tools are going to be the implicit function theorem applied to the fixed point of the um, optimization problem and modern automatic differentiation, which allows us to bypass a lot of tedious numerical derivations. And so let's talk about this derivative. Uh, and this will be the first of three theorems that, we'll, that I'll be presenting. Um, I'm going to need some cumbersome notation, apologize for this, uh, but we're just going to call uh, zero the kind of base optimal value. So without an argument, eta hat is just uh, eta hat evaluated at t equals zero, some kind of base prior. Uh, h hat is going to be the Hessian of our objective function, the KL divergence, evaluated at the optimum. And this NABLA term is just going to be, oh, there should be a partial derivative here. This is the partial derivative of the log of our variational, um, of our log of our variational distribution, again, evaluated at the optimum. All right, so in terms of these quantities, we're going to need to assume three things. First of all, the Hessian at the optimum is non-singular. As a matter of fact, if we have a local minimum of the KL divergence, then this will be positive definite. Well, this is kind of a minimum requirement for doing sensitivity. It is very reasonable. Uh, we're going to require that the VB parameters are interior to their space. Again, that's kind of easy to satisfy. Uh, the condition that's a little bit harder to satisfy is we're going to be able to, we need to exchange limits and variational expectations as needed in a neighborhood of these parameters and our prior perturbation parameter. And this is what's going to impose some regularity conditions on the prior. Uh, those regularity conditions, I'm not going to talk about them in detail. They're easy to satisfy um, in the parametric case. Uh, these are going to enter importantly in the non-parametric case though. Uh, now, if we, if we have these three assumptions, then this map from t to eta hat as a function of t is continuously differentiable at t equals zero with the derivative of the following form. It's got this nasty looking expression. Now, let's take a moment to unpack this expression. Uh, the derivative evaluated at t equals zero is uh, first, it's got this uh, expectation. This expectation is over the variational distribution. So it's a distribution that you know, and typically you've chosen it because you can compute expectations with respect to it. It's of the gradient of the log variational distribution. Again, that's something you know, you can compute it easily with automatic differentiation. And the partial derivative of the log prior uh, with respect to its hyperparameter. So again, you've implemented this in software. You can compute it with automatic differentiation. You take all of this stuff, which depends on your stick, you compute its variational expectation, then you pre-multiply it by the inverse Hessian at the optimum, and that gives you your derivative. Now, uh, the computationally hard part of this is actually this inverse Hessian. So this inverse Hessian is the size of all of your variational parameters. In the BNP model, that includes variational parameters for all of the indicators, so it's huge. Uh, however, it's also sparse. So um, in the case of the BNP problem, we can solve this linear system efficiently and compute this derivative. Uh, the key takeaway is that although this looks complicated, it's easy to compute. Uh, in general, much easier than solving a new optimization problem, even one new optimization problem. All right, so to give an example, I'm gonna step back from the thrush data and just look at a simple toy data set to kind of uh, uh, provide examples of these theoretical ideas, we're going to turn to the classical Fisher-Iris data. 
Uh, so remember, these are measurements of three different species of iris, four different uh, measurements. Here I'm showing the first two principal components. Uh, and each, um, here we've fitted a Gaussian mixture model with a, a stick breaking prior uh, on, the, um, on the components. And it picks out the correct number of three clusters when we uh, fit it with a Dirichlet process prior with concentration parameter six. So let's ask how uh, the number of um, clusters it picks out depends on this concentration parameter for different values of alpha using the machinery of theorem one, our derivative machinery. All right. Uh, so let's focus first on this uh, graph on the left. Uh, this graph is showing on the x-axis different values of the Dirichlet process concentration parameter uh, ranging from looks like one to 16. On the y-axis, we have the expected number of distinct clusters in this data set. So this has a small range here. Uh, it starts about three. Uh, this red line is alpha equals six. That corresponds to the picture we just saw. You see here in expectation, there's about 3.1 distinct clusters uh, in that data set. So that's, that's about right, that's what we saw. And each of these triangles represents re-solving the optimization problem, finding a new variational approximation at all of these different values of the concentration parameter. As so you get this curve, uh, when you take alpha equals 16, it looks like you get about 3.3 expected clusters. When, uh, it's, uh, when alpha is down here at one, you get three expected clusters and it, it varies according to that curve. Now, oh, because each triangle cost a refit, this was an expensive curve to make. Uh, in contrast, this red line is the approximation formed by our linear approximation. So what we did to make this red line is we solved one optimization problem at the red line, computed that derivative, and then extrapolated to the variational parameters at different values of, of alpha using just that uh, vector multiplication formula. Now you'll notice that our linear approximation is actually nonlinear. Again, the reason is we only linearize the expensive part of this procedure, that is the variational optimum. We retain nonlinearities in the map from the variational parameters to this posterior expected number of clusters. You can see that qualitatively it reproduces the same results that we're interested in, which is basically that this quantity is pretty robust to the concentration parameter. It deviates more the further you go from the value at which we computed the derivative. It's kind of what you expect from any Taylor series approximation. All right, great. Now let's take a look at the same quantities on the predictive distribution. Uh, you'll notice that the Y scale has changed, but the meanings are the same. Uh, here, if you ask how many distinct species we would expect to find in a new data set of the same size, this actually turns, to be quite, turns out to be quite non-robust to the concentration parameter. You can see it ranges from um, about four to eight different clusters, depending on what, what that concentration parameter is. And again, our linear approximation qualitatively picks out that, that conclusion. So, uh, but at a, at, a, at a much smaller computational cost. Okay, great. So that's parametric sensitivity. Um, but why would we believe that priors should remain in the beta family? Uh, what, what about if we can replace it with some different um, parametric forms or, or non-parametric forms? So uh, to set that up, we're going to try to ask this question but in the context of parametric sensitivity. So we're going to need to parameterize parametric paths uh, in a space of functions. So to do so, let's suppose that we have P0, which is some base stick breaking prior that we use to compute eta hat. You know, for example, we can take P0 to be the beta 1 6 prior. And suppose we want to replace P0 with some other density, P1. I'll just give you the density. And I say, let's, let's try to swap them out. Well, one way to ask um, what would happen using theorem one is to define a perturbed prior where we multiplicatively perturb our base prior by some kind of log density phi. It's not actually a density, it's just a log perturbation phi. And now if we take phi to be the uh, log ratio of the new prior and the old prior, then the map from T to P evaluated at T times phi parameterizes a path from our base prior P0 to our new prior P1 as t ranges from zero to one. So when t equals zero, and this is just no perturbation, we get back our base prior. And when t equals one, then we get the uh, ratio of p1 to p0, the p0 is cancel and you get our new prior. So when t is one, it's p1, when t is zero, it's p0. And in between, it, it traces a smooth path between the two. So now that we have this, uh, oh, and I wanna emphasize that we're taking a multiplicative path. So uh, if we imagine going from like a, a uniform prior shown in light blue to a, a new prior, which is shown in dark blue, 
Uh, and these are even steps along this path parameterized by T. The steps will be evenly spaced in the space of log densities, but unevenly spaced in the space of densities because it's a multiplicative perturbation. All right, so uh, once we've written it this way, we can try to apply theorem one to this map from P, uh, from T to P of uh, new given T times phi. And in doing so, kind of approximate what it would, what it, what would happen if we walked along that path. Uh, but really, typically we don't have an, a single alternative prior in mind. We're doing non-parametric perturbations because we want to search the space of alternative priors. And in order to do that, we need a little bit more than just theorem one. In particular, uh, we would like to have a general condition on phi so that theorem one can apply for all phi in some kind of set of, of perturbations. And more subtly, we want to ask whether or not the derivative actually provides a good linear approximation for all such functions. Because we're searching through an infinite dimensional space, derivatives can go wrong. So you need to show that the problem is sufficiently well behaved, that our derivative is always good linear approximation. Well, it turns out, again, following uh, Gustafson's work from the 90s, uh, the key to doing this is to embed these perturbations in, in LP spaces. So in particular, with our multiplicative perturbation, we're going to embed them in L infinity. It's the vector space of bounded Lebesgue measurable functions uh, with norm given by the supremum, the largest absolute value of that perturbation. It turns out that if phi is in L infinity, then you get a valid density under the multiplicative perturbation we gave above in the sense that it will always be positive and normalizable. Uh, and theorem two says that our derivative is going to work for all L infinity. Uh, in particular, for perturbations that live in L infinity, then this map from T to the perturbed prior satisfies the condition of theorem one for all such phi. And so uh, the map from T to eta hat evaluated T times phi is continuously differentiable. Uh, but we in fact have more. Uh, it turns out that in L infinity, these derivatives provide a uniformly good linear approximation in any L infinity neighborhood of the zero function. In other words, uh, the technical term for this is that the map from phi to the variational parameters is for shade differentiable at zero as a map from L infinity to the, um, to the real valued space of variational parameters. Right now, so for those of you who are kind of familiar with this stuff know, uh, like for shade differentiability is kind of like a minimal requirement for searching through an infinite space of functions in using a derivative. Uh, all it says is the, the local behavior, um, the error uh, of the linear approximation doesn't blow up. It doesn't necessarily say that you're able to extrapolate to different priors. That requires kind of more um, careful exploration, like experiments or control of the second derivative. Um, but it's sort of like a necessary condition. If you don't have this, then the error in your linear approximation can get arbitrarily bad, even in arbitrarily small neighborhoods. Right? But it's great. In L infinity, we have for shade differentiability. Uh, and as a corollary of this, we can uh, compute and use the influence function. So let's suppose that we have some continuously differentiable quantity of interest. So now we are going to take derivatives of quantities of interest. So say we're looking at the number of clusters. This actually is a differentiable function of the variational parameters. Uh, and uh, we can imagine computing the derivative of that quantity of interest with respect to t, uh, where t parameterizes a direction in the function space phi. So for different perturbations, we'll get different degrees of sensitivity of this quantity of interest. And we might ask, um, how does phi affect this derivative? Well, if you just write out what you have in theorem one, it turns out that you can write this derivative, the sensitivity of your function of interest, as an integral uh, of, a, of a function, which we call the influence function times phi. And to see this, uh, this is just the quantity that we get in, in theorem one. Uh, everything here is an expectation over variational distribution uh, times phi. So basically you just take the, the form of the derivative you take everything that isn't phi, you wrap it into the influence function, and then what you get is an integral with respect to phi. The great thing about the influence function is it tells you exactly where perturbations matter. Uh, where the influence function is large, if you take phi and you perturb there, that will have a large effect on the derivative of your quantity of interest, in this case, the number of clusters. If the influence function is, is small, then you can change uh, the prior in that location as much as you want, and it will have a small derivative. So the influence function kind of tells you what sort of perturbations matter for your quantity of interest. All right, so again, let's step back to the iris data set and take a look at some influence functions. Uh, going from left to right, on the left, we have the, um, the prior. This is the beta one six prior on one of the sticks. The x-axis has that stick proportion and the y-axis has the density. 
uh, it turns out that it's actually a little bit easier to visualize these influence functions uh, in logit space. So uh, this middle plot is the exact same prior density, but uh, where I've logit transformed the x-axis. So instead of being from zero to one, it's now the whole real line. The y-axis has the correspondingly transformed um, prior density. And then this last plot is the influence function for the expected number of clusters in the data set, uh, again, in the logit space. So it actually has quite a complicated um, shape. You can see that there are nodes that are negative, nodes that are positive. Uh, and what this says is that if we align our perturbations with the nodes of this influence function, we should expect changes in the expected number of clusters in the corresponding direction. All right, so let's take a look at that. Um, here we have the influence function again. I'm going to take a phi uh, shown with this gray curve that lines up with the positive node of the influence function right here. So again, this is logit space. I'm going to perturb the prior using a multiplicative non-parametric perturbation that lines up with this node here. And I do that, this is the prior that I get in the stick space. Again, the light blue is the original beta prior. And this dark blue is this new prior that I've perturbed by phi. Now, if I use that prior and walk along the path from t equals zero to one, this is what happens to the expected number of clusters, both in the linear approximation and the refit. It goes up. And the reason we expect it to go up is because this phi lines up with a positive node of the influence function. So the influence function is kind of telling you where to put prior mass in order to cause an increase in the expected number of clusters. Now here are a few more examples. This bottom line now is the, the example we just saw. Let's take a look at the top line, same setting, except now I'm going to choose a phi that aligns with a negative node of the influence function. This is what the new prior looks like. And this is what happens to the expected number of clusters. Because the phi aligns with a negative node, they decrease. And similarly, if I take a phi that aligns with both a positive and a negative node, you get a prior that looks like this, and you get almost no effect, right? So these three priors, you know, if you were to just look at them in the original space, you might not guess that they would have such different effects on the expected number of clusters. But the influence function tells you what to expect. Moreover, taking this even one step further, and again, this is uh, based on Gustafson's work, uh, we can find the perturbation that maximizes the sensitivity. Turns out that this is gonna be easy because we have the influence function. If we wanna ask what's the worst case perturbation in some L infinity ball, uh, remember uh, L infinity is measuring multiplicative perturbations. So this is like a multiplicative window around our original prior. Uh, so here's a schematic of that. If our original prior is in black, this gray is a multiplicative window um, around that. And the log uh, density space is just a band. We're gonna find the, the prior that leads to a, to a the, the perturbation that leads to a prior within this window uh, that maximizes the sensitivity of our quantity of interest. Uh, using Holder's inequality, you can just read this off from the influence function. Because the worst case sensitivity is given by the worst case phi uh, over this integral and um, because this is an L infinity ball, we can apply Holder's inequality with one in infinity. And we get that this worst case is actually just the integral of the absolute value of the influence function, which is achieved at a prior perturbation that's just the sign of the influence function. And so again, let's take a look at that. Uh, for the iris data set and the expected number of clusters, now phi is in gray. This is an L infinity ball of size one. So uh, the, the perturbation just matches the, the sign of the influence function. This is the resulting prior, looks kind of crazy. Uh, because this is in stick space, this is logit stick space, it's a little bit hard to see which feet correspond to which parts of the prior, but this uh, little negative part here, um, this corresponds to this big negative part over here. And this positive part where we're increasing the prior corresponds to this lobe here. And the rest get a little bit hard to see because of the, um, the scale of the transform, but we do affect a much larger change in the expected number of clusters than uh, in the other perturbations. In general, these worst case priors, uh, they often look a little bit crazy like this one does, but if the worst case sensitivity is small, then it's good evidence of robustness. Um, all right, great. Uh, now, you notice that we used a multiplicative perturbation. It turns out that's actually quite important. Other perturbations in a certain sense don't work. And so I'm gonna talk really quickly about uh, why they don't work. Uh, another perturbation that people like is uh, mixture distributions. So suppose instead of perturbing multiplicatively, we had perturbed additively. So we take our base prior, we add our perturbation. Uh, and now if we take this perturbation to be the difference rather than the log ratio, then again, T uh, mapping to the prior evaluated T times phi 
also parameterizes a path from P0 to P1. But now it's an additive path instead of a multiplicative path. So these paths are evenly spaced in the density space, but unevenly spaced in the log density space. Now, is there anything wrong with using this with our VUB approximation? Well, I'm, uh, I'm asking, so you might uh, rightly infer that yes, there is something wrong with it. Uh, and this will be our, our third theorem. Uh, so consider all phi that can be formed from two valid densities. It turns out uh, that in fact, the conditions of theorem one are satisfied, some additional mild assumptions on the variational distribution so that you can form this derivative for any particular phi that's given by the difference of two valid densities. However, uh, if, if you want to choose a norm to, to, to describe how large these phi's are, it turns out that the right norm is the L1 norm uh, because whether or not you can normalize the prior after perturbing is essentially determined by the L1 norm. And the error in the derivative as an approximation to the VB, uh, optimal VB parameter is arbitrarily large in any L1 neighborhood of the zero function even when you restrict to phi that are of the form of the difference of two densities. In other words, you can always compute the derivative and along any particular direction, the derivative already exi always exists. But if you look amongst all possible directions, that derivative is an arbitrarily bad approximation of the true, um, uh, the true VB optimum. As a consequence, uh, this map cannot be Frechet differentiable. Uh, so this basically says you really shouldn't use these because your, your, um, your linear approximation can be arbitrarily misleading. Uh, and it happens that an analogous result holds for all LP spaces with P finite. I talked about P1, but it turns out to uh, be true for all of them. So uh, I would love to fill a whole talk about why this happens, but uh, here's the schematic of what went wrong. Uh, if you think about these two densities, the blue and the red density, uh, they're exactly the same, except I've taken the red density and I put a tiny, tiny little bit of mass very close to zero. Now, these two densities are distant from one another in KL divergence and in the L infinity norm. So this, the multiplicative difference between these two is large, but they're very close to each other in any finite LP norm or where P is finite uh, because the amount of mass at which it's close to zero is very small, right? So these are uh, KL and L infinity and the other LP norms are just, um, uh, they just have very different topologies. Now, uh, choosing a path through the space dictates a norm via the requirement that your priors be normalizable. And it turns out that if you want to have eta hat be differentiable, the norms topology has to match that of KL divergence, right? So the fact that we're using KL divergence and require that our priors be valid in the sense of being normalizable means that only multiplicative perturbations are going to work. And so for Brian's talk, he's gonna take, uh, take over at this point, he's only, only going to be considering uh, multiplicative perturbations uh, for the non-parametric part. Okay, uh, that is it from my part. So now I'm gonna pass it over to Brian. Okay, I'm gonna share my screen real quick. Okay, so can you guys see this last slide? This should be the last slide that Ryan presented. Yes. Um, okay, so... To conclude the talk, I'll present some results on our original motivating example. Um, remember our data type, our data were genotypes from this endangered bird species. And we adapt this existing population genetics model called structure, and we swap out its finite Dirichlet prior with a BNP prior. And remember, one of the first questions we were interested in is the expected number of latent populations and how that varies with prior choices. And so here I'm making that same plot that you guys already saw on the Aris data set, where I'm looking at the expected number of populations, the AKA clusters, and how that varies at, with the con BP uh, concentration parameter alpha. And in this case, the linear approximation in red and the um, refit lines in blue nearly overlap, um, which is good. And you also notice that this posterior quantity, it appears very sensitive to the concentration parameter alpha. It starts from maybe four latent populations at smallest alpha to almost 20 at the largest alpha. And one reason why this posterior quantity is so sensitive is because it is highly dependent on the small rare populations, right? Maybe the probability of a locus belonging or being allocated to a rare population is small, but the prob probability that none of the loci belonging to that population is gonna be non-negligible. And that rare population is going to enter into account of the number of populations. Um, so this motivates the use of thresholding and computing the number of clusters. 
So in the last, in these last two plots, what I'm showing are how many populations are there with at least 20 or 40 loci in them. And you see by this definition and alpha equal to three, which is where our initial fit was, there are exactly three populations. And if you remember from the previous plot, these corresponded to the big um, primary colors, the green, the purple, and the orange populations. However, even with this threshold of definition, the posterior quantity still appears somewhat sensitive to alpha. At alpha equal to one, the number of populations it dipped down to two. Um, and though our linear approximation sort of qualitatively picked up, picked up these changes, they somewhat underestimated the, the sensitivity in this case. Um, now, the, another um, posterior quantity that we might be interested in, and one that's relevant for population geneticists, is the idea of looking at these structure plots and inferring migration patterns. So um, notice that for individuals in this modolo region, right, they're mostly green, though there are some outlying individuals that have more orange than others. And in, in individuals from this Nengao region, they're mostly orange, but there are some uh, individuals that have outlying uh, proportions of, of green. And population geneticists look at this and they might, one conclusion they might draw is that there were, there was an ancestral migration that happened between these two geographic regions. And so what we want to understand is how the BNP specification might impact the scientific conclusion. And as we saw from one of the uh, earliest, earlier slides or one of the motivating slides, um, different prior perturbations might result in different sensitivities. So on the left here is the original beta prior. And on the bottom here, I'm just, I'm just zooming in on that previous plot. I'm just zooming in on those individuals uh, labeled as A. So this is the same plot as we saw um, a few slides ago. Now, after the first perturbation, it seems like not qualitatively not much has changed, right? There's still this sort of large orange um, uh, mixture proportion in these individuals. But after the second perturbation, um, there has now been some qualitative changes. The orange pattern seems to have disappeared or at least gotten a lot smaller for almost all of these individuals. And I use this example to show off the influence function. Right? Again, the influence function is able to well predict why some perturbations result in greater sensitivity than others. So in purple here is that influence function where the posterior statistic is defined as the proportion of orange in these individuals labeled as A. And to construct my first perturbation, I place the Gaussian bump corresponding to uh, at a location where the influence function changed from positive to negative. And doing that inner product in your head visually, hopefully you can see that the inner product between the gray and the purple is going to be small or close to zero, right? The positive and negative parts of this influence function are gonna cancel. And the resulting effect on the admixture proportion of orange is going to be, going to be small. To construct that second perturbation, I picked phi, my perturbation, multiplicative perturbation to be positive when the influence function is mostly negative and negative when the influence function is mostly positive. So again, doing that uh, inner product visually, hopefully you can see that the result is gonna be a larger negative number. And again, and again the refits um, or the resulting admixture after this proportion confirms sort of the predictions made by this influence function the change in um, the proportion of orange after this perturbation is more substantial than, than we saw before. Um, finally, we looked at worst case perturbations. On the left is, that, um, is the worst case perturbation. In this case, we wanted to see how robust these patterns are. Like, can we make these patterns disappear? So notice that the worst case perturbation has opposite signs as the influence function. We're interested in trying to make this pattern disappear. Um, and you can see after this worst case perturbation, um, the proportion of orange in these individuals labeled as A, they, it goes down pretty substantially. It starts at maybe 0 .2, uh, like 25% orange, and it gets nearly halved after this worst case perturbation. We can do the same thing where now we look at individuals labeled as B, and a posterior quantity of interest is the proportion of green in these individuals. And again, we constructed its influence function, we constructed its worst case perturbation. And um, in this case, it, it, it turns out that this sort of green pattern appears less sensitive to the prior specification, right? Initially, it started out as about 50% green. And after this worst case perturbation, it went down to a little below 40%. So still a substantial 
proportion of green in these individuals. And we conclude that this pattern might be less sensitive to, to our prior specification. Um, and finally, so all the results I presented so far are examples where the linear approximation does quite well. Um, it closely mirrored sort of what happened after refitting. Um, but of course, we are doing a linear approximation. And, um, and this approximation is obviously linear. So when the relationship between the variational parameters and the hyperparameter uh, is nonlinear, things might go wrong. So here's just one example. Um, so I'm presenting uh, the individual admixtures again, but after one of the worst case perturbations seen on the previous slide. And if you remember our linear approximation, it actually got the top level statistic right. The top level statistic being the proportion of orange in these individuals. And the refit and linear approximation line uh, basically overlapped. However, the performance of the linear approximation, it's not uniformly good across individuals, right? You can see that there's this one individual that had a, actually a lot more orange after the refitting and our linear approximation was not able to pick up that, that change. Um, so here, I'm just gonna zoom in on that one individual to take a closer look. Um, and remember from the previous slide that this individual had a large increase in orange population, AKA population two after refitting. So that's just what, we're, what, what this plot is showing here as a function of T as I move from the original prior to the new prior. Um, and so in blue is the refit and red is the linear approximation. And you see that we, we, the linear approximation sort of just missed this large increase in, in population two. And the reason is um, the mapping from the uh, hyperparameter to the variational parameter itself is highly nonlinear. So in the bottom row, I'm plotting the variational location parameter of the stick breaking distribution. And notice that for stick one, for example, the refit pattern looks highly uh, concave. Um, the blue sort of increases a little bit at first and then sharply decreases. And in this bottom row, the linear approximation is actually linear um, because we're plotting a variational parameter. So this red line is uh, necessarily a straight line. And so naturally it's not gonna pick up this concave pattern very well. And it overestimates the length of the first stick. So the corresponding admixture proportion of the first population is going to be overestimated by, the, um, by our linear approximation. And because of the stick breaking construction, these errors sort of compound, and we see that the linear approximation correspondingly un underestimates the admixture proportion of population two and, popu and a little bit in population three as well. So this just highlights the fact that we are doing an approximation. Of course, the trade-off is compute time, right? Remember that forming the linear approximation required a Hessian solve, but this only takes a fraction of a second. And once the linear approximation is formed, producing the linearized variational parameters is nearly instantaneous. It's just the scalar vector multiplication and uh, I guess a vector vector addition. Um, but um, whereas refitting the model for at each, in this case, for each alpha, um, it's going to be, it takes a reoptimization and that's several orders of magnitude um, slower. And again, here are some timing results on how to, compute the influence function. Again, that computation is very easy with automatic differentiation. And again, just takes uh, a fraction of a second. So just to summarize, uh, what we do is we provide a tool to efficiently evaluate the sensitivity um, to different prior choices. And linearizing the variational parameters provides a reasonable alternative to re-optimizing. And in particular, it's a lot faster. You only require uh, fitting at some initial chosen hyperparameter and you can extrapolate from that um, nearly instantaneously. Um, as Ryan discussed in, in his section, right, um, when forming variational approximations, we should really try to express functional perturbations multiplicatively. And finally, I hope we've demonstrated that the influence function is easy to compute and it's a useful tool for finding particularly sensitive model perturbations, which can then be investigated by uh, refitting. Um, so here are some links and references. We, we have a currently public workshop paper, um, though we are in the process of uh, submitting this work as a journal publication, which should come soon. And I also wanted to highlight JAX, which is a Python package and that we use to do all our optimization and computation of derivatives. And so I definitely wanted to, to um, cite them and hi highlight, uh, highlight their package. Um, and finally, here are just some citations that, were, uh, that appeared in, in the text. 
And so that's that's all we had. And uh, looks like we have a few minutes left for questions as well. Okay, so uh, let's thank our speakers for their presentation. So thank you. Um, well, we have time for questions. So if you have any comments, questions, uh, please uh, write, raise your hand using the, the tool Zoom. Uh, I want to put the instructions in the chat in case that you don't remember how to do it. So, Well, if not, well, you can just. No, no, no. let's see. Okay. And just uh, thank you to the three of you for uh, for this very interesting talk. That's nice. Um, may, would you say a, a bit more about uh, uh, the computational effort in in this all? No, uh, is it? Uh, Suppose I do some analysis and then I say, well, perhaps I should care about this sensitivity and you give the tool how to, then uh, how difficult and long or quick uh, or doable is to, to do the computations of the kind you show? Is this a stupid question? Is it clear? Yeah, <laughs> can, you, do you want to take this, Brian, or do you want me to take it? Uh, yeah, I can I can sort of reference that. So again, the hard part of the maybe I can go back to the formula um, or the linear approximation. Um, so as sort of what Ryan said, so we let's see, yeah. So here, so as Ryan said, um, the, the 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 computationally hard part is uh, computing this this Hessian matrix, right? We you run you've solved. Um, You've optimized the KL divergence, and at the KL divergence, you have some set of optimal variational parameters. And mm -hmm. first thing you need to do is to compute that, that Hessian matrix. And for these large problems, that can be difficult or even impossible to instantiate the full Hessian matrix in memory. And so what we actually do to compute this Hessian is, or to, comp to solve this, this linear system actually, is we do, uh, we use the conjugate gradient algorithm. Um, so, um, which requires only Hessian vector products. And so you never actually need to instantiate this whole Hessian matrix in memory. And, and just so, so can I add something yeah. to that, Brian, in, in case in, maybe not everyone knows that if, if you've implemented your objective function in Python, say, mm -hmm. then Hessian vector products are computable automatically using automatic differentiation software with no additional coding. Uh, and they're about as fast as a gradient, typically. So uh, it's a uh, Hessian vector product is provided for you automatically by automatic differentiation. Yeah, by, uh, yeah, thank, yeah, I think that's a good point. I'm guessing the concern was probably this, this Hessian computation. So, right. The no, way I, mean, I think it is worth just to add a yet more at a higher level uh, comment. Uh, it is worth saying what automatic differentiation is a little bit more. I'm not sure this audience actually knows. Uh, so there is numerical differentiation, right? You all know what that is. Uh, there's all kinds of varieties of that, and that's you know, 100 years old. And there's symbolic differentiation, and you probably all know about that from Mathematica and all. Automated differentiation is neither of the above, right? Okay. So it's a different thing. It, it, it's if you think about your, uh, uh, your forward computation as kind of a bit of code, you have now a trace through your code. And every, as you're stepping through the trace of the code, you add a little annotation there that allows you to kind of go backwards uh, you know, in the code and calculate. And so this could be done systematically really, really easily. I think Ryan Mill, uh, when I stop talking, he can add a little bit of some pointers. Um, he's written some code to do this, but it's, it, if you ask why the neural network people are having so much success on a large range of applications, part of it is that just gradient descent works well on you know these kind of models. The other is automatic differentiation, is that you don't have to write packages to calculate gradients or Hessians or any of that anymore. It's all done once and for all. And this is really, really important um, in that world. Um, and so I think what we're trying to partly argue here is that this could be really important for our world too, 
that um, if you want to calculate all kinds of these complicated derivatives and expressions that you'll see in papers like for going back to Gustav's and uh, it's done, we got it, it it's handled. So, so Ryan, do you want to maybe add a couple of pointers or co further comments on that? Yeah, I don't have much to add. I mean, that's right. I, I want to emphasize that it's the chain rule basically applied to a program trace. So Mike mentioned that you've got the forward pass of your program. If you can apply the chain rule to everything that your program does and you can, and keep track of those derivatives, then you can compute derivatives exactly just by annotating your operations with, with their derivatives. And, and it's gotten to the point where using JAX, if you've mm -hmm. implemented your objective function in NumPy, which you have, it will just compute these derivatives for you, you know, essentially with a little function decorator and nothing more. Mm -hmm. Super easy to use exact derivatives on code you've already written. So it's really easy. If you are able to use this all, it's possible. <laughs> no, okay. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Thank you very much. Yeah, it, so this is the main story, the main point uh, that could be that can be solved, and then uh, it's not uh, too much computational burden, additional computational burden. So I would like I I'm going to add a, an answer to a question nobody asked, which is that if you wanted to do this with Mon Markov chain Monte Carlo, uh, you can. Uh, this is actually what Gustafsson's work was, um, but it takes the form of covariances. Uh, involving conditional expectations, right? So covariances you get from MCMC, but they can be noisy. As you uh, so might need a lot of samples. Conditional expectations aren't available from MCMC, but maybe you could estimate it with, um, with you know, a Gaussian process or something. Uh, but with variational uh, approximations, it's all just closed form, right? It's available kind of like straight out of the box. So it's an advantage of variational approximation. Maybe just to note, there's a paper that Ryan is the first author of uh, that, that it has, the, I forget the title, Ryan, is Covariances. Uh, robustness and Variational Bayes. Robustness and Variational Bayes. This appeared a couple of years ago in uh, JMLR. And um, it was a real attempt to try to get this kind of core lemma that you'll see in kind of empirical Bayes of covariances or this, you know, the dual of sensitivities. And if you're an MCMC person, you love the covariance side. If you're a variational person, you love the derivative side. And there's a theorem that relates the two of them. So if you want to look at a paper that, um, yeah, thank you, uh, whoever did that. Uh, it's that 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 bullet halfway down the page. Mm -hmm. OK, so any other question? Uh, well, yeah, I have uh, a cover. One is uh, that so far, I would have thought, well, if I don't know how to fix this alpha, I do some empirical based choice. Uh, so can you comment first that you are doing much more? You are considering. So if you consider, suppose that somebody here uh, takes uh, an empirical based choice, so how would, would compare, would be make, would be something that has to do what you have done, done because I think mo most people do that. No, you you would uh, you would get none of the guarantees or none of the insights that we're getting here. You basically- I, I know, I know, I know. I, I do know, I mean, I, I do appreciate. With, you yeah. would, you'd be stuck with trying to sort of argue that the, uh, from a frequentist point of view, it's a frequentist method, right? You'd be stuck with trying to argue that's robust in some sense. And so you probably go to the robustness literature and you probably try to calculate some frequentist influence functions and all that. But of course, no one ever does that. So, um, um, mm -hmm. yeah, you know, yes, that's done in practice, but uh, this is uh, what we're arguing you, you want to be doing more gener generally, especially for scientific applications. And I you know if I may, I ah, know there is Eric. Eric. Hi, Eric. Good to see you. Hi, good to see you. Uh, so I'm, I'm curious, in the, you know, in the last part, we were doing the functional perturbations of the stick breaking priors. Um, how does the how does the refit work in that case, right? Does those take you outside exponential family? So do you have to do sort of numerical integrals to 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 do the refitting there, or like how? It's a great question, uh, Brian. Do you want to? Yeah, that's exactly right. We have to do numerical integrals. So if we were in the family of betas, then we can just use the conditionally conjugate exponential family, mm -hmm. our variational distribution. Um, in our case, we model the logistics as, as normally distributed and do the integral using gauss hermite quadrature. So we approximate those expectations. Um, okay. But the, I, I mean, Ryan, you can jump on this, but the theory will still go through um, as long as that sort of same approximation appears in the objective function as, yeah. The, right. right. Okay. So you might tell the user, start with beta one comma alpha, 
But if you want to be honest, do the stuff that we're talking about in this talk. And then from that, you learn that you're uh, too sensitive. You better go and do, you know, hire up Brian Liu to help you with getting the integrals done. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't want to make it sound too hard. I mean, it's it's uh, hiring Brian is, is a good idea, but it is also, you know, not it's not terrible to, you know, do Gauss or Mike quadrature. Uh, it's just adding a bunch of points together. But yeah, that's that's exactly right. That's what we do. And it is worth mentioning that if all you care about is computing the sensitivities, you kind of don't need it. You can use the beta um, variational approximation. But if then you want to go and do the refit, you're right. You need to do some kind of numerical integration. Thanks. OK, any other question? If I may. Of course. Um, I'm coming from, uh, that's not a question on the seminar, so you're free to say that's another question, but I am coming from a workshop uh, and there was a seminar on variational base uh, something, and then there was, there were questions about uh, how, I know, uh, so is there any proof that the algorithm to compute the variation of posteriors converge? And uh, there was a concern that uh, perhaps uh, say a variation of posterior can have uh, good properties, but uh, in fact, there is uh, there are issue in computing the conditional posterior. And I was surprised because I hadn't, uh, I never thought about this. I never so, suspected so, that there may be issues. So I get, the, if I may, I, I'm getting the opportunity to ask the question to you. Yeah, so there's a huge- not on your, It's not uh, on your seminar. It's, uh, it just came from this workshop and there, were, there was this concern. Um, so let me just try to push it under the rug. I don't think it's an issue. I mean, so most of these algorithms at the end of the day are coordinate ascent. And coordinate ascent converges with just very, very few conditions and very, very generic kinds of problems. Any kind of smoothness and you're, you're, you're done. Um, there's a huge expertise now in, in, in unconstrained non-convex optimization, which is what this is. And uh, even if you don't do coordinate ascent, if you do um, Nesterov acceleration, or if you do some, um, you, know, uh, you know, conjugate gradient sort of things, or, you know, it's just, there's a lot known. And yes, we can get convergence of these kind of algorithms. That it's just a non-issue. Um, you know, it doesn't mean that it converges to a good Bayesian answer. That's what we're trying to do: is be honest about that. No, that's yeah, all. yeah, yeah. That's, uh... you know, the, the, the the optimization side. There's just been so much development in the last twenty years, starting with the Russian school and and many. I, I've been working on that too. Um, many many uh, papers giving non-asymptotic convergence rates. You know, how do you get past uh, saddle points and converge to a good nearby local minimum, and all kinds of just work on that. So I think that part we're pretty good on. I think this more inferential stuff, we're not so good on. We're, we're, we're groping still. I see uh, Isadora is sitting there, who's not, another nice person to see. Hi, it's very nice to see you too. Um, so my question is more like, I, I've gotten a bit into this uh, sensitivity analysis from the side of the operational uh, research people. They do this thing for computer experiments. And uh, the, there's one, question that they usually have, which is, if I have different factors, like different parameters or different possible perturbations, and I, I have a limited budget, so I can only change so much, and I want to choose which of these quantities is more important, which of these quantities uh, is my model more sensitive to. So it, it's not clear to me when you talk about these perturbations and you do the thing with the non-parametric part and the, with the parametric part, if if you can come up with a measure that makes the sensitivity comparable so that I can decide then where to focus my resources. That's, yeah, that's, that's kind of like the, the key question with all of these things is like uh, how, how many of the many, many ways I could vary this thing should I try to vary? Uh, I think um, this, this may not be the, the best answer to your question. I mean, ultimately you have to decide what matters to you and try to see if you can change it by any set of perturbations that you're willing to consider. But from a computational point of view, uh, one really great aspect of this is that the, the Hessian inverse is the expensive part. If you can factorize that or approximate it or get a good low rank approximation to that, that's one fixed cost from which 
every sensitivity you might consider follows computationally with at essentially no cost. So um, this kind of like front loads all of the computation into one relatively automatable and highly studied problem, which is Hessian factorization. Once you've done that, you can compute frequentist variances. You can compute cross-validation is the other work that we have. You can compute sensitivity to the stick-breaking prior to the functional form of the likelihood. Every sensitivity that you want follows computationally from the formation factorization of that inverse Hessian. And so um, there's once you formulated your problem, you kind of increase your computational budget with one particular task, which is Hessian factorization. So I know that doesn't really answer your question, but it like points a way that this helps answer the question, no matter what form that question takes. Great, thanks. Okay, I think that uh, we can stop here. So let's thank again to Michael, Brian, and Brian. Thank you very much. Thanks, thanks.